All right, so here we are for one of the more important parts of this unit. The autonomic nervous system. Now, on our grand hierarchy of organization, you know, we've got our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is broken into sensory... and motor and this motor branch is somatic and visceral the autonomic nervous system is visceral motor so it's a non-voluntary thing it's involuntary you don't get conscious control over this um, but motor neurons here yeah. so What's the function? The function here of the autonomic nervous system is to maintain homeostasis. That's a big thing. Maintain homeostasis. That means keeping you alive and everything running. All these processes that uh, make life possible are managed by the autonomic nervous system. Next semester, for those of you currently in AP, AMP1, uh, when we go to AMP2, we'll start with the endocrine system. The endocrine system is the opposite side of this coin. Also there to maintain homeostasis, the endocrine system uses different methods, but still uh, there's a lot of overlap between the autonomics and the endocrine system. So let's talk about the autonomic nervous system and how it's organized. So our autonomic nervous system is divided into two branches. Sympathetic. and parasympathetic. All right, so what do they do? The sympathetic branch, probably best known because its function rhymes. This is your fight or flight response. The parasympathetic, we can make that rhyme. Um, that is either feed and breed or rest and digest. So, sympathetic branch, fight or flight, this is uh, kicking in for uh, emergency situations so that you can survive some sort of short-term stressor. Parasympathetic, this is what's normally running the show. This is baseline function. Now, let's talk about differences between how they work we're going to start by looking at our parasympathetic branch. So let's draw some neurons. Now, I'm gonna use our cell body for our neuron. Synaptic bulb. Oops. Always striving to provide quality artwork. I don't know, second cell body there. 
and our target organ over here. Tissue. All right. So the first neuron in the chain is our presynaptic Here's our postsynaptic. Occasionally, you'll hear this referred to as the preganglionic neuron, and this as either the postganglionic neuron or just the ganglionic neuron. Since we're in the peripheral nervous system, realize that we're not just looking, obviously neurons, these cells aren't just one at a time, right? They're bundled together. So you'll have a bunch of bundles of the cell bodies will be together, and then a bunch of bundles of the axons will be together. And the peripheral nervous system, uh, a ganglion, It's a cluster of cell bodies. So this part, the cell body over here, um, that part, that's, they're going to be clustered together into a ganglion. A nerve, again in the peripheral nervous system, is a bundle of axons. So this part down here, right, the long cytoplasmic process there, the axon, they'll be bundled together into the cord-like organs, the nerves. All right. So That neuron is lightly myelinated. This neuron is un. Remember that myelination speeds up the action potential, the propagation of the action potential, I should say. So that action potential is going to jump down that neuron, that first preganglionic neuron, very, very quickly. The ganglionic neuron doesn't have to be as fast, because quite often the cell body for the ganglionic neuron is either rather close to the tissue that it's targeting, or nearly on it. There's not very much distance to travel in that postganglionic neuron. Still, the action potential is more than fast enough traveling along this neuron to make this response happen. So, in our parasympathetic branch, our neurotransmitter here at this synapse, again, this synapse is the uh, ganglionic synapse. Our neurotransmitter here is acetylcholine. And our neurotransmitter here at the target tissue is also acetylcholine. The parasympathetic branch anatomically is craniosacral. So cranio from the head, sacral from the sacral plexus of neurons. Our major parasympathetic nerve is the vagus nerve. That is cranial nerve number 10.
All right, so we get rid of some of this. Parasympathetic. Now, let's take a short look at our sympathetic branch. So we can compare. So, here is our... I can do better than that. Some of you are saying, actually, no, you can't. And you are right. Same situation. Also lightly myelinated. Also unmyelinated. So we are preganglionic neuron, a ganglionic neuron, and our ganglionic synapse. Our neurotransmitter here at the ganglionic synapse is once again acetylcholine. But down here, at our sympathetic target, our neurotransmitter is going to be uh, let's pick it for color orange. Norepinephrine. Alright, so now we have a different neurotransmitter. We also have a special case of our sympathetic branch here. Our cell body. Our axon. Expertly drawn. Putting these videos on YouTube and I'm going to get picked up by some uh, anatomical illustration company that totally exists. Super pay me lots of money to do their drawings and their books. Super internet famous for YouTube drawings. Don't crush my dreams. And there's a triangle here. This triangle is our adrenal. medulla the inner part of the adrenal gland and it's going to drop epinephrine and that epinephrine is going to go out into the blood now a chemical message that's released into the blood is a hormone So this epinephrine is a hormone. It's also a neurotransmitter, but it's it's a hormone. It's a neurotransmitter um, would act as a neuron. But here is this overlap that we were talking about earlier between the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. Okay. So now that we've looked at anatomically what's going on, Let's talk about this idea of neurotransmitters at these synapses. We've talked about neurotransmitters. We talked about the action of the neurotransmitter being dependent on the receptor. Well, we have different types of receptors. Let's start by looking at receptors for acetylcholine. Receptors for acetylcholine are called cholinergic receptors.
And there are two main types of cholinergic receptors. Nicotinic and muscarinic. Nicotinic cholinergic receptors are named for a chemical that activates them that you're familiar with called nicotine. Muscarinic cholinergic receptors are named for um, muscarine. Another toxin that binds to them. All right, nicotinic cholinergic receptors are ionotropic, meaning that they are going to be an ion channel for a positive ion. Sodium, for the most part, but in some cases calcium or potassium, but they're particularly responsive, again, to nicotine. They are always excitatory. They're going to let this positive ion, sodium, into the cell, and they're going to raise that potential probably to the threshold they're going to cause the firing of the next neuron where do we find nicotinic cholinergic receptors well one place we find them is at all autonomic nervous system Ganglionic. I have to erase this word. Bear with me. Synapses. So if you go back to the beginning of this, I'm obviously not going to redraw this, even though it was very well drawn. If you go back and you look, that ganglionic synapse, the one between the pre- and post-ganglionic neuron in the autonomic, so sympathetic, parasympathetic, that middle synapse, that's going to be a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. And it's going to cause the next neuron in the chain to fire. Now, there are oh subsets of this but we're not going to get into the different types of nicotinic receptors or other places they might be found um, I, I'm really just worried about its function here in the autonomic nervous system. Our other type of cholinergic receptor, so all ganglionic synapses, our other type of cholinergic receptor is the muscarinic receptor. Muscarinic receptors are metabotropic receptors. So they're going to use a second messenger system. Now, while nicotinic receptors are always excitatory, there are several different types of muscarinic, recept or muscarinic receptors, and some of them are inhibitory. So this can be inhibitory. This can be excitatory. Where do we find them? We find them 
at all. Parasympathetic. Sorry about that. Targets. Anything the parasympathetic nervous system is targeting, muscular rank receptor. For the most part, that's excitatory. It's inhibitory at cardiac muscle. A better way to think of that. It's inhibitory at the heart. The translation for that is that it slows your heart down. So, big picture translation, acetylcholine slows your heart down. Which, again, is that discovery of acetylcholine, slowing the, the frog's heart down. That's a muscarinic receptor. Everywhere else we're talking about this, for the most part, it's going to be excitatory. So let's talk about a medication. Atropine. Now, atropine is an extremely important pharmaceutical. It is uh, considered by, uh, I believe, the World Health Organization as an essential drug for any medical facility. Um, it's safe, it's effective, it's uber cheap now. What it is, excuse me, it is a competitive Reversible antagonist of muscarinic cholinergic receptors. Translation. Where do we find muscarinic cholinergic receptors? Again, at all parasympathetic targets. Which means that atropine is going to block parasympathetic action. Okay. What does that mean? Well, if we're blocking parasympathetic action, what is parasympathetic action? Rest and digest. Feed and breed. Atropine is going to work against that. So what's the parasympathetic action at the heart? Well, the parasympathetic action at the heart, acetylcholine at the heart, decreases heart rate. So that means that atropine, by blocking that action, is going to increase heart rate. It causes the pacemaker of the heart to fire faster because it, it blocks the parasympathetic effect. And the parasympathetic effect of the heart is to slow it down, rest and digest. We use atropine drops in the eye. It causes the uh, outer dilator muscle of the iris to contract and it dilates the pupil. When they, when they dilate your eyes, that's atropine and it causes that muscle to contract and open up your uh, your pupils so they can see the retina um, it will decrease salivation it 
just think overall blocking that that uh, parasympathetic action. All right. So atrophy, blocking those muscarinic receptors. So there are, like I said, lots of subsets of muscarinic receptors. We're not going to get into that. Um, are so for acetylcholine, we have muscarinic and nicotinic receptors, cholinergic receptors. So that covers a whole parasympathetic. Now, what about targets for the sympathetic branch? Well, sympathetic branch, we've got norepinephrine, epinephrine, and receptors for norepinephrine or epinephrine are called adrenergic receptors. If you can hear in the background, my children have discovered a spider in my house. Which is odd. Not that we found the spider, but that they're freaking out and they're my children. Out of my children, all but one of them will come and find me for a spider. The other one will kill it. None of them have my propensity to pick it up and put it outside. Or pick it up and, and keep it in a jar as a pet indefinitely. We'll talk about spiders and my penchant for spiders later. Alright, back to the topic. Sorry, I got distracted by kids. It happens. Adrenergic receptors. Receptors for epinephrine or norepinephrine. These come in different flavors. We have alpha-1, beta-1, alpha-2, beta-2, and we have beta-3. Now these do different things. Some of them will be excitatory. Some of them will be inhibitory. And there are subtypes of these. We're not going to get into the subtypes. Alpha-1 receptors... are excitatory. As are beta-1 receptors. Alpha-2 receptors are in the brain. And alpha-2 receptors are complicated, to say the least. We're actually not going to spend any time um, with alpha-2 receptors. Um, it is located on smooth muscle in some blood vessels. Um, but again, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of... Um, any agonist or antagonist that would commonly be used at least in people so we're going to skip alpha 2 receptors just mostly they're in the brain and it's neurons and so yeah I'm not overly concerned with alpha 2 receptors beta 2 receptors much more important beta 2 receptors are inhibitory Beta-3 receptors are on uh, adipose tissue. And 
it calls you to mobilize fat. So I'm not super concerned with those either. These guys, alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2 receptors, I am more concerned with. And that comes back to, I suppose, the big picture of the sympathetic nervous system. So the big picture of the sympathetic nervous system is, again, fight or flight. Well, what does that mean? That means that we want to provide as many resources to skeletal muscle to either run away or to fight your way out of a situation. When I say resources, I really mean oxygen and glucose, what your muscles will need to work. So basically, the big function of our sympathetic nervous system is to reroute blood to the heart and skeletal muscle. So we're going to sort of shunt blood away from the, the guts, the, the intestines and the kidneys and stuff. And move that blood out to the muscle because that's what's going to need the most resources as you're trying to run away from the tiger that's chasing you. Because someone put sardine oil on your shoes. So, how do we do that? Well, we change the diameter of blood vessels. We're talking about those alpha-1 receptors. Alpha-1 receptors are excitatory. And for smooth muscle, the muscle in the blood vessels. So, let's say we're talking about the blood vessels. Excitatory for blood vessels means that we make that muscle contract. So, that is what we call vasoconstriction. So those alpha-1 receptors do that. They make blood vessels constrict. And if you constrict a blood vessel, well then you cut off the blood supply to whatever that blood vessel is going to. So we'll find alpha-1 receptors on things like blood vessels to the skin. Because, quite honestly, your skin does not need the blood supply right now. You know what it does? Your muscles. So, we constrict those. And we decrease the blood flow to the skin. We're also going to decrease blood flow to the guts and decrease blood flow to the kidneys. beta-1 receptors still excitatory but these beta-1 adrenergic receptors are at the heart their job is to increase heart rate and increase the force of heart contraction which we'll talk about in a semester right now you can think of it as speeding up your heart so when you release norepinephrine at these synapses, right, blood is shunted away from the skin. So let's say the tiger starts chasing you. If you have ever seen anyone get chased by a tiger, well, right, they're pale. When people get scared, they're pale. Right? Blood drains away from the skin because blood vessels to the skin constrict in that fight or flight response. Heart rate goes up, and the heart's going to be pumping more blood out to the muscles so that you can hypothetically escape the tiger that's chasing you. All right, as I said, we're going to pass on alpha-2 receptors. And we'll pass on those beta-3 receptors, too. So that leaves us with beta-2 receptors. Uh, 
like I said, beta-2 receptors will be inhibitory. And we're going to find them on blood vessels to the heart. Not the heart itself. Blood vessels that go to the heart. And blood vessels that go. So blood vessels that go to the heart. Blood vessels that go to skeletal muscle. Now, in a blood vessel, remember that excitatory means vasoconstriction. So that means inhibitory means vasodilation. So now we're going to get more blood flow to those organs. More blood flow to the muscle, more blood flow to the heart. We're also going to find these beta-2 receptors on the bronchioles, the bronchi, the airway. This results in bronchodilation. What's that mean? That means that your airway gets bigger so that you can bring in more air. More air means more oxygen. More oxygen goes into the blood, which is being pumped to the muscles, which are using that oxygen to contract, to create ATP to contract. So we're providing these tissues with what they need so that you can escape the tiger. So on your exam, forthcoming, there will be questions like, what type of receptor do you expect to see on what tissue? One way to do this is just to memorize the types of receptors you would see on tissue. But another way to do this is just to think of the big picture idea of the sympathetic nervous system, rerouting blood to the heart and skeletal muscle. Is it the skeletal muscle? If it is skeletal muscle, well, the blood vessels that go to skeletal muscle are going to have beta, excuse me, beta-2 receptors. The blood vessels of the skin are going to have alpha-1 receptors. The heart's going to have beta-1 receptors. Let's put this into practice. So if you have asthma, you have an asthma inhaler um, albuterol. Albuterol is your emergency inhaler, your fast-acting inhaler. And... Um, so what's going to happen is during this asthma attack, your airway constricts, making it hard to breathe. When you use the inhaler, your airway is going to open and you can breathe again. That's because albuterol is a beta-2 agonist. meaning that it binds to those beta-2 receptors. Basically, it's acting like norepinephrine or epinephrine. And so what you get with albuterol is bronchodilation. Now, is it that specific for those beta-2 receptors? No, there's going to be some overlap. So think about your side effects of albuterol. If you have an asthma inhaler, your side effects include rapid heart rate, because it acts like epinephrine. It's going to speed up your heart rate. Maybe dizziness, because it changes that blood flow. Jitteriness. So here is, when you think about the sympathetic nervous system and, and big picture function, this is going to be my greatest analogy here. Let's talk about crystal meth. Methamphetamine. So you've seen meth heads. You live in Lubbock or Leveland. Right? There's, there's some of this going on. So think about your classic meth head. What do they look like? Well... The first thing, oh, better yet, 
you've seen Tiger King. There you go. So what does that dude look like? Not the Tiger King himself, but one of the other dudes. Um, no teeth. Dude's got like two teeth. Why? Well, because crystal meth acts like the sympathetic nervous system. It acts like epinephrine, norepinephrine. It's a sympathetic mimic. And the sympathetic nervous system response to salivation is to stop it. We get decreased salivation and reduced blood flow to the mouth, I mean, among other things, pretty much everything but muscle. So saliva is constantly flushing your mouth, constantly swallowing bacteria, and there's a crap load of bacteria in your mouth, constantly swallowing them, keeping their numbers slightly in check. As their mouth dries out, those bacteria just run rampant, and uh, reduced blood flow reduces the uh, immune system's propensity to help you in the mouth, and to be honest, I mean, you're, you're looking for another way to get, uh, you know, another box of Sudafed um, toothbrush and toothpaste. You're probably not on your uh, Walgreens shopping list. Let's think, what else do we see uh, in your classic method? Um, they're super skinny. Why? And, and incidentally, this is those alpha-1 receptors. Why? Because we get reduced appetite. Because blood flow to the, the intestines is going to be reduced. You're not going to be absorbing anything anyway. Um, even in the brain, you get reduced appetite, and we're not going to get into those. Um, alpha 2 receptors like I said um, and also you're going to burn more fat you get fat mobilization and that fat burning happens with those beta 3 receptors um, what else uh, lots of sores on the skin that won't heal the pick of their skin and it bleeds and, and it's not getting any better because we get decreased blood to the skin again those alpha 1 receptors we decrease blood flow to the skin so um, mild infections of the skin which are ubiquitous I mean think pimple or, or just blemish or the infinite number of microorganisms that's currently on your body, your immune system keeps those in check, and your immune system is a lot to, has a lot to do with, with blood flow. And when we cut off blood flow, we reduce the amount of nutrients to the skin, so we reduce its ability to repair itself and to regrow, and we cut it off from the immune system, leaving you open to these opportunistic infections, which take a long time to heal when you're on crystal meth. The other effects here are, again, much like your effects in the sympathetic nervous system. They're jittery, they're nervous, they're not thinking straight because of those receptors in the brain. Uh, the increased heart rate, just like, like you are in this fight-or-flight response. So that's the sympathetic response. Rerouting blood to the heart and the skeletal muscle. There are not always opposing actions of sympathetic and parasympathetic. For instance, um, the sympathetic branch is in charge of blood vessel diameter. There's not an opposing parasympathetic action here. The 
parasympathetic causes normal sort of digestion, digestive function, that sort of thing, and um, all this visceral function. And a lot of times there's not an opposing sympathetic action. The sympathetic branch just reduces blood flow to those organs. But there is some difference in how they work in terms of, of duration as well. Your parasympathetic branch has very short-lived effects. Why? Because it relies on acetylcholine at the synapse. And that acetylcholine is constantly being removed by acetylcholinesterase. And as soon as it's gone, the effect is gone. The sympathetic branch, comparatively, has longer lasting effects. Why? Because not only are you releasing norepinephrine at the synapse, you're releasing epinephrine into the blood as a hormone. So now, if it was just norepinephrine, well, yes, reuptake would take it out, and then monoamine oxidase would break it down. But you're also dumping that epinephrine into the blood. And that is going to take some time to get out. The liver, the kidneys, you've got to get it out of the blood. So it's going to circulate for a while. Right? Um, after the tiger chases you, should you escape the tiger, your heart's going to be beating pretty fast for a while. You're going to be shaken up. Because that sympathetic effect is still there. Until that, that adrenaline rush, if you will, is gone. There are some opportunities for these two branches to work together in terms of reproduction, but that's a topic for another semester. Let's look at another way that we can use this. If you have allergies, severe allergies, um, you have a child with severe allergies, you will find that you own an EpiPen. EpiPen. Ask your doctor about prescription EpiPen. What this is, is an injection of epinephrine. So you're allergic to something of peanuts. Let's say you eat peanuts. What's going to happen? Well, and this process, you're going to anaphylaxis because of histamine which causes vasodilation and blood is going to move out to the periphery and it's going to escape and you're going to have peripheral edema meaning that fluid leaves the bloodstream in the periphery and you're going to swell up like a balloon that's problematic because when that happens that fluid's leaving the blood and your blood pressure is going down that's so decreased blood pressure peripheral edema and the last one bronchoconstriction so your blood pressure is low which means circulation cardiac output is going to be reduced and your Airway is constricted. You can't get any air in. So you can't get any air in. Your heart's not pumping enough blood. Your tissues will become hypoxic or lacking in oxygen very quickly. And, and you can die. What that EpiPen does, and if you've ever seen one, there's directions on the pen with the EpiPen um, on, uh, on one of them. And the name escapes me at the moment. AviQ. Uh, there's like a little tape recording that plays and tells you how to do it. But the, the gist of it is, is it's an automatic ejector, injector. So you you stab them with the, the needle end of this device, and it uses, a, let's say, fairly large needle to inject a lot of epinephrine into your blood intramuscularly very quickly. And then you get your... Sympathetic response. The sympathetic response cancels all this crap. Not the epinephrine. The sympathetic response is epinephrine. But it's going to raise your blood pressure by increasing heart rate. 
it's going to cause uh, vasoconstriction. So that vasoconstriction to the extremities is going to cancel out that peripheral edema. And it's going to cause, possibly, most importantly, bronchodilation. And you can breathe again. And if you've ever seen this work, one, it's it looks freaking painful. But two, it is a magic trick. You go from this, this kid that's swelling up and changing colors. It's like popping a balloon. Like they deflate and they can breathe again. The magic of the EpiPen. So there's another example of how that sympathetic branch works and how we can use that. So like I said, this is going to be important because this is going to tie right into where we begin when we start talking about the endocrine system later. So for now, that's all. I will wrap all of this up shortly. We've still got uh, a few more things I want to talk about. Um, just to sort of tie some loose ends up. But we're nearly done, and we'll uh, follow up with some other lectures later.